from GBH Forum Network. This is Footnote. So why do we use footnotes? First of all, to reference the sources, and also to add some comments. I'm Andrew Vanoss, digital media producer for the GBH Forum Network. We record about 100 public lectures a year, presenting them on YouTube and our website, forum-network.org. Politics, history, climate science, and mental health are just a few of the big subjects we explore with the help of academic experts and global leaders. On this episode of Footnote, we enlist the help of Boston-based activist and artist, Reverend Mariama White Hammond. She spoke with our executive producer, Annie Schreffler, in the fall of 2019. White Hammond responds to some thought-provoking ideas from a lecture by Harvard Divinity School professor and public intellectual, Cornell West. His talk is based upon a collection of essays published more than 25 years ago titled Race Matters. He wrote about issues then that are still urgent today. West refers to the many social and economic crises that America finds itself in, including what he calls a culture of mendacity. Reverend White Hammond is devoted to efforts to confront racism in her own community and also speaks out frequently calling for action to stem global climate change. She knows that culture can evolve, but only when individual activity and collective will changes. I think you see young people right now um, around the country just calling it out. I mean, Greta Thunberg says like, apparently, you know, you tell me I should go to school, but apparently I have to be an adult because you're not behaving like one. You know, I, I think at the point you know millions and potentially billions of people are going to die and you're doing anything else. I'm sorry, what do you what do you call that? Right. So I think um, we are at a sad moment. This is Footnote, a podcast about ideas from GBH's Forum Network. Financial support for this program is provided by the Lowell Institute. It's been 10 years since teenager Trayvon Martin was killed while visiting relatives in Florida in a gated community. Since then, Black America and their allies have assiduously tracked the killing of Black and brown people by police. In May 2020, George Floyd was murdered while in the custody of four Minneapolis police officers. This horrific crime, videotaped by bystanders who tried to intercede, touched off demonstrations throughout the nation and an evaluation of diversity, equity, and inclusion at just about every level of society. And there's been a pushback from those who see America and its history as exceptional, leading to efforts to prevent students from learning the complete and often ugly history of slavery, racism, and genocide. America remains divided, not only over what to do about social and economic injustice, but over what constitutes facts and the truth. Will people who look and speak differently from each other ever get along? Or will we allow fear and intolerance to push our society further into chaos? Professor Cornell West has been writing and speaking out about racism and American culture for years. Here is an excerpt from his 2017 lecture on Race Matters, his collection of essays about love, jazz, black history, white supremacy, and economic oppression in the United States. I begin with an acknowledgement that we live in a nation that's been shaped by a vicious legacy of white supremacy, but there is no white supremacy without resistance to white supremacy. And I am who I am because somebody loved me, somebody cared for me, somebody attended to me. So in the face of white supremacist attack, black hope, a joke, black freedom, a pipe dream, Black history, a curse. Black love, a crime. That I'm a product of that black love. That I'll never be the, the human being my mother and father. The highest honor I've ever received is to be the second son of Irene and Clifton West. To come out of Shiloh Baptist Church to Reverend Willie P. Cook. And in those days we had pastors, not CEOs. The market model hadn't taken over 
the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and other civic institutions, including the universities with the corporatizing and marketizing, commodifying of our universities. No, I come out of a tradition of a flawed people, but a people who have been serious about confronting the hatred of white supremacy and yet teaching the world so much about how to love. That's what John Coltrane's Love Supreme is all about. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On and the love-soaked essays of James Ball and Tony Morris and Nina Simone. These are not icons to be invoked. They are constitutive features of a tradition that is shot through my heart, mind, and soul. So I begin with prophetic fight back, given the spiritual blackout. Now, what is spiritual blackout? What is the relative eclipse of integrity, honesty, decency, and generosity in our culture is shot through every institution, every site, every sphere. When you talk about race matters, you're only talking about a particular tradition that's trying to reinforce the spiritual blackout. But we live not just in a democratic em experiment, but we live in an empire. And that empire is in deep spiritual decay and relative decline. And when I talk about spiritual blackout, I'm talking about one, the normalizing of mendacity. Well, lies are viewed as the normal way of life. And I'm not just talking about a gangster at the top named Brother Donald Trump. That's too easy. He's not isolated. He's not alien. He's not extraneous to the American experiment. He is as American as apple pie. He just happens to be the worst of the American experience. <laughs> but he's not all by himself, and that's very important because the last thing we need is to think that all we need to do is extricate some isolated individual, and lo and behold, we're able to get back to business as usual. No, business as usual already normalized mendacity. As I recall, it was Brennan that said, yes, we have drone strikes, and they have not killed one civilian. Quit lying. Yes, Wall Street is in fact accountable. We're going to ensure that the rule of law rules. Quit lying. No Wall Street executive went to jail. We know that given that massive criminality of market manipulation, insider trading, fraudulent activity, and predatory lending. Lies, lies, lies. And when you normalize mendacity, you naturalize criminality. So that we, what used to be crimes against humanity, lo and behold, become business as usual. 22% of America's children living under poverty in the richest nation of the world, that's a crime against humanity. The top three individuals in America have wealth equivalent to the bottom 160 million fellow citizens, 50% of Americans have wealth equivalent to the top three brothers. That's a crime against you. Now, why use that hyperbolic language? Precisely because that level of grotesque wealth inequality generates forms of wounds and scars and bruises, unbelievable forms of terror and trauma, psychic as well as physical. And where are the righteous indignation? Wow. You want to respond to Cornell? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, one of the things I think he points out, which is accurate, um, is that this is not, it, it's not like this suddenly happened. Um, I do think that for many folks who look at where we are right now, it does look a bit like we're in a culmination moment. Um, and for some people, that may seem new. I, I think culmination for me is much a much more accurate way of looking at it. Um, a moment in which a number of things that have festered in our society for quite a long time, some of them centuries long, some of them decades long, um, have sort of come together in a way um, that seems new 
Um, and I and I do want to say I think there is a degree um, that that does feel um, that a, a, a new level. <laughs> um, you know, the the sort of growth of this idea of fake news and this contestation. And sometimes you're like, but but you're literally on tape saying it. <laughs> How are we contesting this? Right. Um, you know, so I, I do think, it, you know, I have seen a lot of people f- since really since 2016 and really before the election, even in the wake of how you know, those conversations unfolded over that summer and, and fall before the election actually happened. Um, people feeling like this is something overwhelming. This is something new and something different. And I think I want to um, acknowledge that, that that may be what, what people feel. I think that it is um, really sort of this undercurrent coming to the fore in a way that we couldn't ignore it. Right. Um, and so then the, the question is, and one of the things I appreciate about... Um, what uh, Robin Cornell says is that, you know, this is deeply spiritual, and I actually believe that's true. Um, <laughs> even if it's ugly. <laughs> even if it's ugly, because I think that um, facing the truth, facing the situation that you're in, is the first step to asking yourself the question where you want to be and how you move from where you are to where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think is hard is that we as a people... Um, And this is not anybody's like, I mean, I think our leaders obviously could do better, but we also have to uh, be honest about the fact that sometimes we don't always want to hear the hard truth about where we are. I was watching the Democratic debates and, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, to you know, (laughs) some people had asked me about running for office and I said, look, I, you know, I don't want to win unless people are ready for the kind of work that I would want to do. Yeah. And they're like, you cannot get up and say to people, I don't know if I'm going to win or not, but this is who I am. And I was like, why can't you? Mm. Because if... If Trump can. Right? Like, <laughs> you know, this idea that you have to, like, pretend like you have solutions and you have to project, you know, and, and there's certain hard things you can tell people, but you can't tell people the full hard truth. You know, and I'm a pastor. I get that. Like people come in and they're like, why is this happening? And I could be like, well, let's talk about the three things that I see. And you're like, you know, (laughs) you have to help people as a pastor. You have to you cannot in your first counseling session tell people point blank everything that you see because you have to help them see those things for themselves, because if they can't see them for themselves, Mm -hmm. they're not going to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I get that you have to um, sit with people and meet people they are. But I think as a society. We have a hard time being honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. One of the surprising things we learn in Cornell West's presentation is the idea that struggle breeds generosity. African Americans have taken some of the hardest body blows in our history and have given the world some of its most memorable arts, literature, music, and more. From Coltrane and Aretha to Baldwin and Morrison, they have confronted white supremacy and taught us all how to love. A tradition that is beautiful and flawed, Wes says, but one that Mariama White Hammond embraces. You know, I'm a a black woman. Um, The black church tradition has not always been um, welcoming to women's voices being heard equally. Um, And so there's so much beauty in the tradition and there's also some brokenness there and I think you know one of the things we talk about at, at our in our congregation a lot is that we are all beautiful we are made in the image of God we are imbued with so many beautiful things and we are all broken every single one of us has places where we struggle things that we're working through things that we are not working through because we are trying to suppress them it's in every single one of us the problem in our society has been the tendency to want to see some people as beautiful and some people as broken. And so then we build people up as if they're perfect and then we act shocked when they are not. We also look at some people and can only see negative in them all the time. We, the littlest things that they do, we pick it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we need a society that is far more nuanced about the reality that each of us has gifts that we got to work together to pull out. We got to make sure that every single person is getting the resources that they need to manifest the gifts that they have to offer the world. And we also have to recognize each and every one of us got some hot mess <laughs> up in us. And um, 
And again, that like an ability, you know, it's like you see, I mean, it's in our criminal justice system. White people do the same exact crime. And it's like, oh, well, a second chance, they're going to outgrow this. But when, you know, and I've seen this, you know, you go and it's a black child do the same thing. And it's like, oh, my gosh, we need to teach them a lesson. The only way they're going to learn is they're going to get locked. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't I'm not asking for you to pretend like black children are perfect because they're not. They're human. But their humanity has to be seen in the same way that everyone else's is. I think, you know, one of, somebody asked me, you know, with the whole uh, Emmanuel 9, how how were their families able to forgive? And I think the reality is that in the black-white dynamic, and there is more to the world than that, than that dynamic, but in, in terms of that dynamic and its long history in slavery, um, I think black folks have more uh, awareness and understanding of of the nuance of, of white communities than white folks have had in return. Um, I think, you know, black folks have lived in white houses and raised white children and understood both the beauty and brokenness of them. And in general, white people don't have the same level of varied interaction with black people in black communities that black people have in reverse. Mm-hmm. And so I think that... Um, Some of us, and not all of us, because we are not a monolith, have been able to see white people do really terrible things to us and recognize that they are more complex people than that. And so I think um, there are ways in which, even within our tradition, there's a tendency to believe that humans are both beautifully imbued with the spirit of God and able to do really terrible things. Hmm. Um, And I think when you're able to hold that tension, you're able to see and interact with people in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, we are not perfect. I don't want to sell that image. I don't want to say that all black people believe X, Y, and Z, because that's not true. But I think that, um, when you've lived under white supremacy, um, when you know what it is to be deeply dehumanized, um, it doesn't take away your ability to do that to others. But I think it makes you just a little bit more um, apt to question yourself before taking that um, same tone with another person. Right. Not perfectly, <laughs> by any, stre- any stretch of the imagination. Right. Um but I think there are more tools within our tradition to hold that nuance, to hold um, that reality. And I think he also talks a little bit about, about hope. Um, I think hope is a huge part of our tradition and the ability to see beyond one generation. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I find challenging about sort of... Um, the tendency for white Christianity to be very individualized and and very like what is happening for me right now. Whereas I come out of a tradition of folks who were living in slavery knew that they probably never were going to get out themselves and, and were able to project their hope to the, to the notion and the dream that I would exist. Mm -hmm. Like they They knew that they would not see what they hoped for in their lifetime, and it didn't kill their hope. And so I think when you extend your vision out beyond yourself, and you're able both to look back to the people who may have had it worse than you, the people who set things up for you, the people who laid a foundation for you, when when you're able to look back towards them and say, I have a responsibility to not give up because of what you did for me, Mm -hmm. and I have a responsibility to do something in this moment that allows new possibilities for a person I will never know in the physical at the same time. Um, There are times when I feel uh, sometimes a greater connection with Jews who have grown up with the Exodus story as like a central story because I grew up with that as like a central story. Yes, I mean, Jesus is a huge, part, you know, important part and the way we understand the cross and, and what it means to be, you know, you know, uh, subjected to capital punishment for, right. for something that you're innocent to. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. <laughs> That's a different read than I think your average um, 
a white Christian tradition. But I think that this notion that um, God sees the suffering of a people mm -hmm. and will not leave that to be the final word. Mm -hmm. But there were definitely people who died in Egypt and never saw freedom. There are people who died in the wilderness and never saw freedom. There are people who came to freedom and forgot the past. There, you know, so, but they're still one people together. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, that part of, ex of looking to the past and extending forward um, changes your understanding of who you are and what your responsibility is in a way um, should incline you to be a little bit more honest. Honesty is a good policy. But as Cornell West points out, Truth demands taking risks. A love of truth and condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. And a love of goodness that keeps track of evil, of undeserved suffering and unwarranted pain. And a love of beauty. There's no love of beauty without wrestling with terror, as Rilke and the other poets remind us. You got to work through time and work through history and work through the forms of a death. And for my tradition, and the people that produced me, it's 244 years of social death, of slavery, that's race matters. That's where it begins in the modern U.S. history. Critics of West have branded his statements hyperbolic at best. Consider climate change, though, says Reverend Mariama. Aren't we running out of time to take bold steps and recognize our role in the problem as well as the solution? At the point you know millions and potentially billions of people are going to die and you're doing anything else. I'm sorry, what do you, what do you call that? Right. So I think um, we are at a sad moment. Um, and I think, you know, for me... Part of what I do is I take in the fullness of the hot mess, recognize how bad it is. One of the things I think is really important and one of the things I encourage people in our congregation to do is to be very honest about how much each and every one of us in, is enmeshed in this. Because it's very easy to point fingers at someone else. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. Like, we need to hold Jeff Bezos accountable and we need to... like. Yes, there are big people to be held accountable for the big role that they play. But every single one of us is implicated in this. Um, and yes, I want indignation where I think and I, I don't think this is a point of disagreement with with uh, Dr. West. But I, one of the things that, you know, I say about when I talk about spirit filled organizing. First of all, you have to see this problem as cosmic and, and bigger than any one person, that, it, that the thing that is hurting us is an ethos and a way of being, not just one decision, one company, you know, one bad policy. This is a way of being that needs to shift. Then I think we all have to recognize that ain't not one of us who's not in, enmeshed in this way of being. Maybe there's some very small group of people like out in the Amazon that are, you know, totally living in a, in a different way. Right. But the majority of us, particularly, especially those of us who live in the richest nation in the world, are enmeshed in this way of being. And so you've got to do the spiritual work, in my opinion, to move yourself away from this way of being. Like, I go to speak all the time and people are like, should we be taking individual action or fighting for policy change? I'm like, both. Because if you think that this ethos is a cancer that's killing us, you, of course, have to try to be ridding yourself of it, even as you're saying to other people, we got to get rid of this. How do you show up and tell the governor he needs to do stuff when you're not being bold in your own life? When you're being bold in your own life, you will bring a fierceness to this and a humility to this that, in my opinion, can really get through to the hardest to reach people. I tell people when I do organizing, it's always an invitation. If you're making a decision that's going to kill our kids, I, I can't let you do that. I can't let you do that. And I don't think that's the best of who you can be. And so I would love for you 
to join me in figuring it out. And I, and I can accept that, like, we may not have the same exact way of getting there, but I'm going to call you out if you're not joining me and trying to figure out how to save our kids. So I, I may have to get arrested in your office. I may call it out for what it is, but I'm not going to demonize you because at any moment you could wake up and join me too. You could decide that your gifts and talents could be used for their highest purpose of figuring out how we're going to save ourselves. Well, you've already made this feel very welcoming to join you, you know, mm-hmm. your open arms. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. The idea that, um, you know, you're not going to judge. You're mm-hmm. just going to try to recruit more people to mm-hmm. your cause. In those causes of really fighting white supremacy in mm-hmm. particular, because Wes talks so much about mm-hmm. this being about race. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Rachel Rollins, um, Renee Graham wrote a, an essay about her talking about how she had said, you know, it's not enough to be an ally mm-hmm. to us. It's you need to be an accomplice. Yeah. You know, you need to be a co-conspirator. What what do people that are not from your tradition need mm-hmm. to know? What do they need to understand to really cross that line and join you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, there's a number of things. One is I think people got to do the internal work to figure out the way in which you played out in this ethos. Every single there, nobody gets to skip that step. And the deeper you you have been implicated in it, the less likely you have to have been looking at it over your lifetime. So sometimes the more privileged people have a harder time and a longer road to go because. Some of us have been looking at since we were three years old and four years. Life made it so that we didn't have the option not to. So you got to do the internal work. And that's everything from do you talk too much? Do you are you pushy? Are you like all of that stuff about what kind of person you are to other people? Hmm. So that I just want to say that Mm -hmm. that got to be done. (laughs) Um, I think the other thing is really um, looking at these systems and saying, Where have the benefits been unequal? How do we shift it? And um, you can't go, oh, well, that was just in the past, so let's just start moving forward. I mean, the same thing I talk about looking to the past for strength, you also have to look to the past for harm, which means that you may have to make up for some of what your ancestors did. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people have a really hard time. They're like, well, I didn't do that. But you benefited from it. And how do we get to a different place if we don't start mixing the pot in a totally different way? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think some of that is showing up and asking hard questions. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing I think, you know, I want to know is I can't tell you how many, uh, particularly white folks, will say, well, what can I do to help your community? One of the things you can do is organize in your own community. You can push other people to have to ask these questions. You can sit with your, you know, cousin who you really don't want to talk to in Thanksgiving and and actually not just yell at them Mm -hmm. because yelling at them is not effective. You may have to sit and listen to them for three months saying stuff that makes your blood boil so that you can build enough of a relationship to actually have a deep, honest and potentially transformative conversation. It's hard work. It'll make you be frustrated. But, you know, I I don't want a bunch of white people doing self-righteous, you know, work with other folks because I know that junk doesn't work. Mm-hmm. If you want people to really hear you and really shift, you have to show them that you love them and you care about them. So maybe everybody not staying in Boston, but going, I am going to move back to Kentucky. I'm going to go back to, you know, Idaho. I'm going to spend some time in Kansas where I'm from. And I'm going to organize there. And I'm going to actually love these people, even in their white supremacist attitudes, so that I can have a deeper conversation about why white supremacy is harmful not only to people of color, but to the psyche of white people. That hard work should be done by people from those communities who have a better chance of getting through than I ever do. You know, so I think that we have become a society that's like with these ridiculous fault lines that, I mean, some people don't even feel like they live in the same country. And somebody's got to do the work to bridge or else we're going to be in a very dangerous and, and, and harmful place.
Thank you to Reverend Mariama White Hammond for her insights and for helping us dive into Professor Cornell West's lecture, Race Matters. In 2021, Reverend White Hammond was appointed to Boston Mayor Michelle Wu's cabinet. White Hammond serves as Boston's Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space. Footnote is written and produced by Dave Goodman, Frederic Rigolo, and Andrew Vanas. We had production assistance from Lauren Joe Alicandro. Annie Schreffler is our executive producer, and Footnote is a project of the GBH Forum Network. We are grateful to the Lowell Institute for their financial support of this program and our ongoing efforts to document the big ideas and bring them to you. Our website is forum-network.org, where you'll find Professor West's full presentation. And please come back for another episode of Footnote. I'm Andrew Vanas. Thank you for spending your time with us.